to start and go on with the program. So we should go ahead. Yeah. All right, so we're keeping our promises today. Um, we want to welcome those who are joining online. I suspect that we have quite a substantial viewing audience online, given the nature of the topic. We're very happy, of course, to have those of you who are joining in person here at the University of Guyana's uh, Education Lecture Theatre. We're going to start the program now, and I want to invite you to stand, please, and say the National Pledge with me. I pledge myself to honor always the flag of Guyana, and to be loyal to my country, to be obedient to the laws of Guyana, to love my fellow citizens, and to dedicate my energies towards the happiness and prosperity of Guyana. Thank you so much. I don't want to delay us. I want us to welcome very quickly, immediately, Professor Paloma Mohammed, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Guyana. I usually have a bio that I want to say, and I, I work in the Vice Chancellor's office, and I don't want to threaten my job. All I'm going to say is our visionary and fantastic Vice Chancellor will welcome you to the University of Guyana. Thank you, good afternoon. I didn't pay him to say that. I usually don't like a long, you know, introduction because it takes away from the time and then anybody who wants to know anything about anybody nowadays, they can read. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this has been a really wonderful day. Um, you know this morning that we received the prestigious Perry uh, Center Award for Excellence. Yes. And um, I understand we have over 10,000 hits on the president's page already, etc. cetera. So um, you're famous, Dr. D'Angelo. Uh, luckily, you're such a smart dresser. So <laughs> Uh, and so we're really delighted to host this afternoon, um, along with our partners in the Guyana Defense Force and the National Intelligence Agency. Um, I see uh, Colonel Howell here, thank you, as well as members of the force. Um, I know Brigadier Khan is doing something else. And of course, to acknowledge the presence of Adrian Galnik, our friend, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission in the U.S. Embassy, Michelle Smith, who works on security uh, and governance from the United Kingdom. I'd like to recognize, of course, uh, Debbie Hopkinson, who's the director of <clears throat> the Institute for Resiliency, uh, Strategic Security and the Future, or ISHER, as we call the Institute, as well as um, Dr. Jackie Murray who I'd like to ask to stand because Dr. Murray and uh, Brigadier retired Bruce Lovell, please stand Bruce, <clears throat> were among the six-man uh, six panel that put this, uh, the master's program together. So thank you very much. Uh, and the others are Dr. Troy Thomas, uh, Dr. Malcolm Williams, Ms., uh, Dr. McDavid, uh, one of them here on the panel, uh, Dr. Lee, um, and Natalia Bob Semple, who is somewhere around, uh, who convened. I'd like to also um, welcome all the members of the Perry Center who have come. Uh, they traveled just 36 hours. Really, that's a really horrendous trip, and they're looking incredibly fresh for it. Um, uh, so this afternoon we have um, doc on our panel Dr. Mark Hamilton and uh, Dr. Bettencourt, who is an old friend of the university, um, 
from the Inter-American Inter -American Defense University as well as the Perry Center, which is inside there. I'd like to also acknowledge the head, the director of their alumni. Um, I'm not sure that if it's the Department of Alumni and International Relations, but you'll forgive me for getting that wrong, as well as the director of their um, communications, Darla. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to you. I'm not going to take up much more time. I'd like to acknowledge also the other members of the panel, um, a panel that was very carefully put together. Um, so, we also have, not also, a very important gentleman, uh, Captain Jerry Gavaya, who is the National Security Advisor uh, to the Government of Guyana, and many, many more things. Um, he is a distinguished son of the soil, a true patriot, and um, a businessman par excellence. So thank you, uh, Captain Gavaya, for being here this morning, as well as being here this afternoon, and for accepting our invitation. Uh, Dr. Lee, who, as I said, is a member of the faculty of his her, but also part of the team that developed the master's program. So he's teaching in it now. So we're really delighted that you're here. And Ms. Ovi Thomas, who is one the best graduating student for cohort two uh, from the, uh, the master's. And I'm really delighted that we have a, a girl, a woman, uh, the, other, the other person was a male, <laughs> but uh, an, an equally excellent, but Ove. Um, and I have to say that the Perry Center distinctly required and requested that we have a woman on the panel. And we thought we'd put a young woman on the panel. And of course, um, our, for today, um, Dr. Norwell Hines, who is the director of our Institute for Energy Diplomacy, um, has his own interest in diplomacy, etc. Um, so we have an interesting panel. We have an audience online, and I think we have quite a number of people online. It's difficult to get up to the university at this hour of the day because of the traffic. It's just killing. So I'm very certain that a lot of people are joining us online. And uh, Excellency, good afternoon. Uh, for, thank you for coming. And we have some diplomats here. Um, who have joined us and some others who have said they're on the way. So without saying anything further, the issue of governance in the world, in Guyana in particular, and its relationship with um, how we are able to develop and grow is really significant. And uh, I am really looking forward to this panel this afternoon. And I wish to thank the inimitable Dr. Bittencourt for proposing this topic, um, which is really exciting, and, I, and, and uh, I think we can learn a lot from this. As we said, this kicks off our uh, two week, uh, we're gonna have a bi month, a bi weekly uh, series where we're asking all of the embassies to do a forum like this, but not, it won't be streamed, it's gonna be closed for students of this the center as well as international relations students of the university as well as our partners and that starts uh, that's in alphabetical order so USA America number one as first <laughs> so um, in a couple of weeks time and then we have everybody going uh, all the other embassies if they wish to participate doing so I'd like to recognize also the presence of Dr. Livius and of our Deputy Vice Chancellor for um, academic engagement. He's actually on a bit of leave, but um, he joined us this morning and he just walked in, Professor Emmanuel Cummings. And I know that our Chancellor and quite a number of, of, of our University of Guyana alum from around the world are online. So thank you all for being here. And so with those few words of welcome, I'd like to hand the proceedings back to um, Dr. Hines, and if I didn't call everybody's name in the, in the, in the, in the audience, please forgive me. Uh, we really are trying to keep on time because our guests are actually leaving um, tonight, <laughs> early in the morning, and they have another engagement at 8 p.m. tonight. So we're trying to stay on time. So thank you very much, and welcome. God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chancellor. 
And of course, today is a celebratory day. This prestigious award that the university received. Now that you've been welcomed to the University of Guyana, I have been introduced and I also want to introduce myself. Um, Norwell Hines uh, Institute for Energy Diplomacy and I want to say just a minute uh, a plug for the Institute. The Institute for Energy Diplomacy really is set up to support various publics in articulating their energy agendas. And when we say publics in this sense, we talk about governments, we talk about civil society, we talk about private sector. So it's both training, it's training research. Within the Institute is embedded the University of Guyana's energy think tank. And we support sort of the work that the university does in shaping the, the, the thought leadership for the country in the region because Guyana incidentally happens to lead the region on energy matters. So uh, this is what the Institute of Energy Diplomacy does. Of course, governance uh, being very important in that, myself, my own academic interest in governance and institutional issues um, and the geopolitics of energy. Having said that, before I introduce uh, the director for ISHAR, and I always get the acronym wrong, but I'm no, I know for sure that she will correct that, I just want to say a little bit about how we envision today's conversation going, both for your purpose uh, and for the panels. We have a very distinguished panel, and the topic is a most pertinent topic. It's a very important topic. The panel is highly qualified, therefore, to present on the topic. We want to ensure that we maximize the engagement here, and therefore we're asking that we engage during the Q&A with the issues that the panel has brought to our conversation today. You did hear that the panel has an engagement at 8 p.m., which means you have roughly 30 minutes post-event, in the post-event mingle, to directly engage any panelists that you would like to on matters that you think were not covered in their presentation and that you would like to engage them on briefly. The panel will each present their opening remarks in about two minutes. It may be a Guyanese two minutes, um, but we will give them the latitude and the opportunity to therefore elaborate uh, their ideas uh, in two minutes or so. That will be followed by sort of a round of conversation where the panelists sort of feed off of each other's uh, presentation. So they'll sort of respond to each other's issues or issues presented by another panelist. And following that, we will have an engagement that includes the audience so that this is truly participatory and conversational. So, I hope that that helps um, in terms of framing how we see this uh, unfolding. And I would like to now introduce Mrs. Debbie Hopkinson, the current director for the Institute for Human Resiliency, Strategic Security, and the Future, and the former Master of Social Work coordinator within the Department of Sociology here at the University of Guyana. She's also the current campus advisor to the Student Social Work Association and president of the Guyana Association of Professional Social Workers. Mrs. Hopkinson holds a master's degree in social work with a concentration on planning and management from the University of the West Indies, a postgraduate diploma in education, and a bachelor's of science degree in social work, with distinction, I might add, from the University of Guyana. Mrs. Hopkinson is a strong believer in her faith, uh, she celebrates her relationship with Jehovah, and she's happy to uh, share that faith with others. I also want to invite her, of course, to introduce our panelists this evening. Thank you, Dr. Hines. And of course, it's always good to come after the first or the second speaker because then you get the opportunity to say, all protocols have been established. With that said, I'll get right to what I'm here to do, and that is to introduce this most distinguished and expert panel. So to your extreme right 
is Dr. Louis Bittencourt, who is an expert in business strategy, innovation, and leadership. He's also a professor of international security and governance at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. He was also the director of the Brazil Institute at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in the Brazilian Federal Administration. He performed several functions related to research and training and strategic planning, total quality in the public administration and international security at the Carter Lake University of Brasilia. Dr. Bittencourt was a professor and dean of the Fat Faculty of Social Sciences. Louis also worked for the United Nations as a regional coordinator in East Timor as a member of the team of electoral experts in Tajiks, Tajiks, well, this is a nice word. Give me a minute. Yes, thank you very much. And as a rapporteur for the UN Commission on Intervention and Sovereignty. Please welcome Dr. Bittencourt. And just so you know, the reason why we read these biographies is to enable you to understand that the panel before you, they're qualified to, have the, to be on the panel. Next, sitting next to Dr. Bittencourt is Dr. Mark Hamilton. And he is originally of Rochester, New York and Concord, Michigan. He received his BA in Spanish from Taylor University where he graduated summa cum laude. He later earned his MA in International Development and PhD in International Relations at American University. Dr. Mark Hamilton now serves as an inaugural member of the Inter-American Defense College, college's permanent faculty. Core academic courses developed and taught at IADCE include multidimensional security in the Americas and conflict analysis and resolution. He also provides instructional and advisory support for the annual faculty and staff orientation, advanced research and writing workshop, and targeted study trips and student academic seminars. Professor Hamilton conducts his classes at a college in Spanish and English, reflecting to some extent the linguistic diversity that characterizes this unique international educational institution. Please welcome Dr. Mark Hamilton. Moving along, right next to Dr. Hamilton sits our own faculty member, Dr. Wilbert Arlington Lee, who is, who is a retired colonel of the Guyana Defense Force and recipient of the Military Service Medal of the Orders of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. He held several operational and administrative capacities in the Army for over 36 years from 1979 to 2015. Dr. Lee has distinguished himself in the academic disciplines of leadership, strategic defense, security planning, and governance policies. He, he holds a Master of Arts degree in strategic defense studies from the National Defense University and earned his doctorate in transformational leadership at the Back University, both in the USA. He's also a graduate of the Caribbean School of Theology and the Haggai Leadership Institute. Dr. Lee is a beloved lecturer in the Master of Science in Strategic Development Studies program at, and we say, Ersef Isser. Whichever one you choose, it's the Institute for Human Resiliency at the University of Guyana. Please welcome Dr. Lee. And Sitting next to Dr. Lee is Captain Gerald Govaya. He is the National Security Advisor to the President of Guyana, Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, and has over 40 years of experience in the security, travel, tourism, and aviation sectors. Prior to this current role, Captain Govaya served in the Guyana Defense Force for over a decade, reaching the rank of Major and serving as the Chief Pilot of the Army's Corps. He is a highly skilled airline transport rated pilot with more than 20,000 hours of flying time in the jungles of Guyana, South America, and the Caribbean. Captain Gavai is the founder 
of Roraima Airways, Airways Corporation and has held several leadership positions at various levels of the Guyanese society. He received his education in aviation from the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and completed studies in hemispheric defense and security at the National Defense University. He holds certifications in aviation safety and security studies and aircraft accident investigation. He has been honored with a prestigious Golden Arrow of Achievement Award and various private sector awards for his contributions to Guyana. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Now for our final panelist, and I'm very, I'm extremely pleased to introduce this particular panelist. And certainly not because she's a woman, but of course because she's a scholar and a graduate of the Master in Strategic Development Studies. Mrs. Ove Adams was raised on the east coast of Demerara in a rural community within an extended family. During her early teenage years, she developed a strong passion for helping others and appreciation for community and solidarity. This passion led Ove to pursue a bachelor's degree in social work from the University of Guyana. Following her bachelor's degree, Ove embarked on a journey at, at the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security, honing expertise in domestic violence case management. Extending these experiences, she is a graduate of the Master of Science degree in Strategic Development Studies from the University of Guyana. Ove brings to the panel an expert in gender issues, women empowerment, trafficking in persons, migration, and strategic development. Distinguished invitees, I give you your panel this afternoon. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much, Mrs. Hopkinson, and what a wonderful, wonderful uh, team we've got here. I don't wanna delay further. I just want to invite Dr. Louis Betancourt. Please, sir, you have the floor. You can use the podium or you can speak from the... For the first two minutes? Two, please feel free to have your elaborate... Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Norwell. Good to be here. Actually, very good to be here was checking my pictures here right now. And they just noticed that I have a picture with President Ali, with Ambassador Lynch who was here from 2022, when this program was launched. And uh, I'm, I'm so proud of for what you have done, done. Frankly, yeah, this is a fantastic thing. So, Having our director here, our team, to witness this moment and to celebrate this with this award. You know, William Perry was also a professor and was a professor in, he was uh, the Secretary of Defense when uh, the, then the, the center was created 27 years ago, the William Perry Center. That's why we celebrate so much uh, Mr. Perry. Uh, as, as well as Mr. Perry, I was a mathematician initially and then became a political scientist. So uh, witnessing this moment for you is a fantastic moment. So in, in this first, first approach, I would like to invite you to check our website, uh, the William J. Perry Center, and you will see there are many opportunities for you perhaps to attend our course, to attend our events, and we hope to uh, continue work with you. Uh, my plan in respecting the time we have and the colleagues of the panel and uh, your ideas is uh, to address three specific points. Number one is to clarify a little bit, uh, Debbie Paloma mentioned about the topic, De Debbie mentioned that. Uh, I think we, it's our, 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 our duty as defense uh, experts or defense students to look around and think about how this country is going to be in the next few years. I see that we have in, in the title uh, concern with the future. Of course, it's all the future. But there is a particular moment, and that's why we call this moment a turbulent world moment. Uh, what is there this turbulence about? Uh, and many could say that, well, we ever had turbulence in the world. 
But there's something peculiar in this moment that I want to think, to think about. And then in my next moment, I will clarify what I have in my, why is this so peculiar, so curious? And second point, I would like to quali qualify what I mean for defense governance. And this is, what is a program that we have been developing at the, uh, with the Paris Center. Uh, it's a, also very peculiar the way we address this issue. You may have seen this concept apply in different ways. Uh, for many, defense or governance means in, in, integrity, uh, non-corruption, transparency. This is one interpretation. Uh, we believe for our topic is more useful to think about defense governance, about everything that is necessary to secure an effective, efficient, transparent way to manage defense establishments within the democratic environment. This is the challenge. And you see there are several contradictions. And my point of departure, departure is to think that we are all incompetent. Govern, governments establishments are incompetent. Defense establishments are also dysfunctional, per definition. You can think about that. Why is this dysfunctional? Because if it's a static, the moment we are having, and then we have a group of people that are making decisions, and then you have disciplined people and hierarchical decision making, you say, well, this is good. Well, if the world is static, it's good. If the world is changing, we have a very dysfunctional environment or organization to address different challenges in the world that are happening all the time. So this is what I want to address with you, uh, just to call your attention to the necessity that we have. How do we resolve that? And most of the solutions is exactly in the education. If we don't create the critical mass that in the future will make those decisions much more current with the technologies that we have. My kids are much more educated in technology and probably your kids too than I can be, but this is going to be their world. The artificial intelligence is producing a revolution in the world that we think, well, maybe this is not for me. Well, it will be for you. And we will have a responsibility understanding better that, what kind of implications we have that, especially if we have responsibilities with the future of the country. And then my, my second topic I will address more, and of course I will align this with the questions of our moderator. And the third point, I will bring it to your attention, uh, things that are happening in Guyana with, with a grain of salt. I have a profound respect for the, the culture of the country, realities of the country. No one can know better than you what you're facing. But sometimes a foreign eye can see your country in a different way. And I've heard once in my life that the best thing that happens to you when you have a responsibility in the government is when you can see your country with a foreign eye. Because we notice things that normally we don't. So those are my three topics that I want to address with you later. Thank you, Dr. Bedencourt. And we're going to move uh, swiftly to Dr. Hamilton. I just want to point out uh, Dr. Bedencourt did uh, invite you, direct you to the website. There are some uh, flyers for the Paris Centre also uh, on the table just uh, near the door. Feel free to check those out. Dr. Hamilton, I invite you. All right. Well, first of all, all of the pleasantries that we've heard so far. Um, I'll try to get right to a little bit of discussion, but it is such, it, it is wonderful to be here. Um, and we're humbled um, to be with such an esteemed panel and, and to learn from all of you uh, in this process as well. Um, I've had the privilege, I, I teach at the Inter-American Defense College and, and we've had the privilege of having several students over the years that have taught me about your beautiful country. Um, and some of those students are now in leadership roles and, and so as we engage back and forth with them, we, we continue to learn more. So I'm going to kind of pull the scope out a little bit and, and talk at a hemispheric level. Um, we were going to talk earlier today that the president was speaking about kind of thinking from a global and a hemispheric frame. 
Um, so I'm going to do that briefly, and then I'm really looking forward to hearing the national context on this uh, from our next speakers. Um, but I'm going to talk about multidimensional crises that we have going on, and then maybe a few multidimensional responses. Um, I teach multidimensional security. It's an organization of states, of American states concept, developed about 20 years ago, um, that all of our countries signed on to and very few of us pay much attention to. Um, but I think what it can offer us um, is it's a list of all of the different threats and challenges that are faced in the hemisphere that everyone signed on to. What it doesn't have is a lot of structure of how to prioritize or how to engage. Um, but it does bring us, we don't just think about national security. We have to think about environmental security. We have to think about um, issues around politics and economic and, and social environmental factors. All of the things that you're all working on in this, in this master's, in the institute. Um, and so for me, I think I'm preaching to the choir, if you will, um, in terms of the importance of a multidimensional approach. And within that, I'm going to use four metaphors uh, briefly. Four, the first one talking about the problem, and then three that maybe look toward our response. Um, we're here in a region that gets hit by, I mean, the Caribbean in particular, gets hit by lots of hurricanes. Uh, it gets, there's a lot of torments that go, a lot of turbulence, if you will, um, that we're seeing. And as I think about the crises that we're facing, we have an economic crisis in the region. We have massive amounts of inequality that are going on, informal economy, and even where you have economic growth, trying to get that to be something that is sustained is very difficult. Um, and that's region-wide. Um, we have humanitarian crises. We have natural disasters that are going more and more based on climate change. We have migration issues that are attached to those things as well. We have political crises. And many of our countries in, in the hemisphere According to surveys, more than 50% of the population says, I don't know if we need democracy anymore. That's concerning. Um, we have a violence crisis. We have the most violent, the most violent region in the world, all right, when you look at homicides and things like that. We have a criminality crisis, all right? We have criminal states and we have very active criminal networks within our states. We have a corruption crisis. Uh, in a lot of our countries, you look at about 25 to 30 percent of the people say that they can trust the police, say that they can trust the judges, et cetera. I'm not just speaking about your country here. I'm saying this is hemisphere-wide. And all of these, if we think of these as separate hurricanes that are all coming to our shores, they're going to attack our little house. And the question is, what's going to happen with our house? And the cornerstone of our house becomes the most important thing. And what is the cornerstone? Our institutions. And again, what's the largest crisis that we have in the Americas? It's an institutional crisis. Uh, Latino Barometro, they did not actually survey here. But in the 18 countries that they surveyed, 80% of the population in every one of the countries said that the government does nothing or very little to support my life via their institutions. We should be concerned about that. Um, and so with this, we have all of these hurricanes that are coming to our shores and our house is in crisis. So what do we do about it? And, and I have three other quick metaphors. The first is pretty easy. I think in some ways we need to be architects. We need to work on becoming architects. We need to rebuild our foundations stronger. We need to build institutions, not just to build them, but to build them to be more inclusive, to get more people involved, and to have something as you're looking for resiliency. All right, so I think that you're on the right track with this. The second metaphor is, uh, that I'd like us to think about is, um, comes from an ancient Asian fable. Um, there was a wise man, and he told several blind men, tell me what's in front of you. And so one touches and says, it's a tree. And another touches and says, it's a snake. 
And another says, no, it's a fan. And he says, all of you seem in the right, but all are in the wrong. They had an elephant in front of them. And they were touching different parts of the elephant. There's a camel metaphor too. There's different ways to do this. But I think of that in terms of our crises. We have different types of crises and we think the crisis that is in our face that we think is right here is the only one there. That our sector is the only one. I work within the defense sector. All right. But if I think the military is the only one that can solve it, I'm going to run into problems because I'm seeing with a military lens. And so all I'm going to see is the snake. And I'm going to come up with the best security strategy to beat the snake. The problem is it's an elephant. It's not going to work. So I need to have this broader base. I need to have this broader thing. So the second metaphor is we need to think like the wise man and understand that we have an elephant. And that means bringing more actors to the table and understanding that the threats we face are multidimensional. And then the third is we need to um, be a mechanic, all right? We're going down, our house is breaking down, we, we come up with mechanisms in the inter-American system to try to solve the problems, but they're out of alignment, like a car that's out of alignment. I, I, my car is currently out of alignment, and when I drive, my wheels are moving. We need to get the car back in alignment. I need a good mechanic, and I need to pay for it. Because if I don't pay any money, no one's going to fix my car. So we need to invest. We need to pay for the mechanic. We need to be a wise man and see the elephant, or a wise woman and see the elephant. And then finally, we need to be an architect and build strong and inclusive institutions. And I think as we go through this, based on this, sovereignty is messy and institutions matter. Taking unisectoral elements or solutions, whether that's militarized, whether that's social work, whatever, are like trying to charm the elephant. And then finally, we need to start somewhere, seek opportunities to collaborate, and we need to pay the bill. So thank you very much. I think I'll leave it at this height and I'll tiptoe for uh, these speakers. I think we coordinated that well. Uh, Dr. Lee, I invite you. Thank you so much. Turbulence, governance, defense. When I first saw the topic, um, I reflected on two, um, two books I read. One by Francis Fukuyama that spoke about um, end of time and the fact that with the fall of the Soviet Union and the fact that capitalism was on the rise and liberal democracy was also on the rise, the prospect of the world looked real fascinating and it seems as though war was a being a thing of the past. It also reminded me of the Soviet um, sculptor that presented, um, I think it might have been in 1959, that piece of artwork to the United Nations that spoke to beating our swords into plowshares. The second book I reflected on was the third wave written by Samuel Huntington that also spoke about the spread of liberal democracy. Now placing those two um, concepts, those two prognoses together, um, the world seemed to be heading in the right direction. However, the start of the new millennium, we were confronted with what uh, our friends from the United States will remember quite clearly, the 9-11 attack. And it ushered in what is now known as asymmetric warfare. I'm referring here to the 9-11 um, attack on the United States. So turbulence um, seemed to have taken a new dimension, a new perspective, where we had previously been accustomed to conventional warfare. We are now confronted by asymmetric warfare, 
that makes prediction of what will happen next seemingly or almost impossible. Now, how do we put that together um, in the defense scenario or the defense structure? The defense structure or the defense system, it's known for um, its strength, its diversity, and also its ability to be very destructive. Added to that also is the fact that national security seemed to be hidden at times um, within the confines of being not accountable. And so if we are going to develop strong, a strong governance system within the defense sector, we need to apply some of the principles that are quite obvious in other public sector organizations. And so I refer to the fact that the nature of defense, the size, its privilege, access to classified information, its ability to garner sophisticated weapons, and the ingrained culture of secrecy makes it susceptible to administrative and perhaps um, political malpractices such as corruption, abuse of power, and even its co-optation by criminal elements. So how do we fashion governance given the unpredictable nature of turbulences, and also the fact like what I think, I um, can't remember the name of the British general that spoke about the utility of force. How do we bring it together um, to make democracy work or to strengthen democracy? Again, I refer to Huntington when he wrote in a seminal work, The Soldier and the State, where he spoke about professionalism where we spoke about accountability and the fact that we need to find the way to strengthen civil military cooperation. In fact, this institution that I am proudly a part of offers such important training that we can bring together both military and civilian enterprises to really strengthen institutions, so that the liberal democracy that we all talk about and we'd like to see foster can be a reality. Thank you. Captain Gavaya, I'm going to lower the microphone if you don't mind. Could we do this here? <laughs> you could do that too. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. Um, very useful, that was a very good two minute, use of two minutes, I would say. We went right back, we covered the entire world uh, and post-World War II development right up to the current time. Uh, Captain Govaya, the extraordinary um, Guyanese son, I invite you. So that I don't give you the satisfaction of lowering the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you very much. I wanted to position my comments in the objective reality of Guyana. Um, and uh, first of all, to also premise it on the, on the statement made by Dr. Bettencourt, that what we are discussing is within the framework of democracy. That when you think about governance, defense, uh, defense governance, um, it happens in countries all over the world. And not all of them embrace the concept of democracy. But we are talking about this in the, in the in the, context, in the context of democracy and good governance. Um, in terms of Guyana and our architecture, when it comes to our defense governance, um, the commander in chief, the president himself, heads the defense board. So we have a defense board that basically manages the defense sector. Um, and we, there's a lot of overlap in defense and security. And so there's a national, um, there's a National Security Council 
um, that is also chaired by the president. And of course, the, the defense board deals with the, with the wider picture of border security, the, the Ghana Defense Force and their role. And then of course, the, the National Security Council deal with all the issues of domestic security and the things that go along with that. I want to say that as well, and to put this in context, that our defense and security systems, a lot of it was developed back in the 1960s. And so this was recognized by policymakers. And so in 1999, around there, the Defense University actually came to Guyana and, it, and proposed to work with the government in Guyana in, in developing a defense, and security a defense and security sector reform strategy. That is, this is for the, the Ghana Defense Force and the police force and the prisons and the fire service, which forms our joint services. A lot of work was done on that, and then unfortunately it came to a screeching halt. Um, there were some minor changes and reform going on in our, in our sector until the British came along and decided that they would propose to us a, a national security strategy reform which was being done by the British government, it was being funded by the British government, and again, tremendous consultation was done, and a lot of work was done, and part of it requires embedding um, expatriate professionals in the police force to help with that reform. Unfortunately, that also came to a screeching halt. And so what we do have, unfortunately, is still a police force and a GDF, a Ghana Defense Force, that was developed long time ago and their reform to deal with current threats and challenges in 2024, I believe that we are behind the power curve. Um, even our defense spending over many, many years were behind the power curve. I think in the last budget we've just seen the defense spending went up by 100%. Uh, we've seen it both in the, in the Ghana Defense Force and the police. So we are, we are playing catch up. Um, and so this discussion here today and the work that Michelle is doing in the police with the, with the security sector reform is vitally important for us to meet the challenge that we are facing today. Now, I think when we talk about defense um, governance and we deal with all the threats, we are facing at the moment a very significant threat which all of us know what happens on our western border. And we are using, at, the at this time, uh, very conventional means of keeping our eyes on our borders and protecting our borders. But the need to reform our security spending and, and equipping our army, our forces, our police force uh, with drones and technology and ISR equipment, um, we, are, we are really, really playing a, 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 a strenuous game of catching up at the moment. So I wanted to put Guyana in context to where we are, and then we could discuss some of the threats that we are facing as we go along in this discussion. Thank you, Captain Gavaya. Actually, Major, if you were to use your, your uh, retired um, Army uh, designation. And I must say that I always like when, when people break the rules. For me, uh, part of my interest is innovation. And uh, you can't innovate if you don't break some rules. So thank you very much for breaking the rules. I, because no rules were set. And that's exactly the point, <laughs> thinking out of the box. So our lone female panelist, now we have two pathways. Now there's a, what we call a bifurcation. <laughs> so you can choose to come to the podium and deliver your introductory remarks. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Given my height, as you can see, I would have opted to sit, but I will stand before you. Okay, so um, one thing I wanted to stress on is, was actually covered by Dr. Hamilton, which I believe just goes to show how important a point it was to stress. So we know that challenges are often evolving, and they're often new ones, and all the realms are affected by these challenges, whether it be socioeconomic, environmental, political, cultural, infrastructural, whatever. So I believe given 
that all these realms are affected, it's only natural that we have a collaborative approach to addressing these challenges. I believe that having a collaborative approach can bring diverse perspectives on how we handle these challenges. It can give us different angles to approach these challenges from. For example, you may be working in one sector and you may not be aware that changing something in that sector can have implications for another sector. So that's why I believe when making these decisions, we should all come together, look at it from different perspectives, and go forward. And while going forward, we are weighing the pros and cons of the different approaches that we want to take. So apart from this, I believe that we must always be adaptable, we must always be resilient, and we must also have great foresight and anticipate certain emerging trends. Dr. Wilbert Lee would have mentioned that though some of these trends are sometimes hard to anticipate, I believe we can still sit, brainstorm, and actually think of possible things that may happen and so that we can be better prepared to address these points. For example, um, I just there might be things that we may be overlooking right now, certain things that we may view in as being small that can actually pose a very significant threat one day. So it's our duty to look at these trends, look at what's going on in society, and anticipate what could happen as a result of this. For example, um, GAN is developing at a very significant rate. We have influx of various nationals coming in. So from a social work, sociological perspective, um, their research that shows what this mix, what can happen as a result of this mix. We're having persons from different cultures, different backgrounds, they're all bringing different beliefs. Sometimes there might be tensions among the locals and these persons. This can um, make new subcultures emerge. This can actually make new crimes emerge. So we must look at how our military, our police, are we adapt, um, or are we equipped to tackle these emerging um, trends or the new crimes from different cultures. So that is just something I wanted to stress on. Um, yes, I'll be short like myself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Adams. And thank you, the panel, for uh, I think useful uh, and necessary frame for us to extend our conversation. Dr. Hamilton sort of gave us three broad areas that I think we can use to frame the conversation. He talked about the, what the architect does. So we need to, if, I, if you'll allow me, let us elaborate that. He talked about being the wise man really understanding in a deep way what the challenges are and the structure of the challenges. And then he talked about being the mechanic. And in particular, he talked about those institutional arrangements. So I wanted us to use that, if, if he'll permit us, as sort of the framework for how we go forward in the conversation. At this point, as we did indicate at the beginning, it's really for the panel, and you can remain in in your places, this time we move the microphones. There are three microphones on the table. It's to sort of respond to any issue that you heard from another panelist or to elaborate an issue that yourself uh, you introduced. Um, we heard from uh, Dr. Lee. He did introduce questions of uh, good governance. The Latin, actually it was Dr. Ha Dr. Lee, Dr. Hamilton who introduced the Latin American public opinion poll which Guyana used to uh, at least when I was involved in civil society, we used to be very much involved in that. I'm not sure the state of affairs now. But that became significant for people like me involved in civil society and governance issues, using that as a framework for how we develop um, programs. And Dr. Lee did uh, sort of bring us into this question of polarities, a multipolarity versus unipolar world uh, following World War II. Where are we now? Uh, relationships, multilateral versus bilateral relationships, globalism versus internationalism. So those are some broad uh, 
context framing type of ideas that we can elaborate on. So first I'll open to, to, to you if anyone wants to extend a particular point or respond to a point. Yes, I, 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 I do think that we should take this opportunity here, here to, to really uh, think in series about what we could do, which is the architecture that Mark was referring and was referred here. So we can talk about many platitudes and we'll be all happy. But my sensation is that we have now to land and think about, okay, if this is the reality, what we could really do to push this situation ahead. I was collecting today during the presentations, uh, and I noticed that uh, uh, our dear Colonel Howell here said that the journal on, journey on defense education is just beginning. Good. Then uh, President Ali said, uh, we must lead by example. Good, another thing. So we have uh, Brigadier Omar Khan saying that we need to replace Guyana for architecture of security for a better security standard. There is more to be done. I mean, this is a serious assessment. That we, so my point when I mentioned to you that we are all incompetent is a serious one. Look at that, well, smart people, serious people, intelligent people make serious mistakes all the time. And when we are together, we also make mistakes for even more reasons. There, there are studies to prove that sometimes we tend to follow the leader uh, just because we don't want to create problems. So this is all part of our problem to understand better the context and to make good decisions about that. So my point is that, that the structurally, defense establishments and governments are not well suited for the challenges that we are facing. The key, the key issue cre creating the problem now means the pace of the change. Things are changing very fast. And things are changing for Guyana much faster for different reasons. I have a sensation that Guyana is becoming from a, a ruler taker into a ruler maker. So people is asking you about positions. Are you ready for that? So this is a question that we have to ask ourselves when we have a responsibility in the government. Do we have the best institutions to that, the best architecture for that? If not, what should we do in the short term and the long term? In the long term, we have several explanations here. I think, I think your engagement with education is a good call. We have to form the generations of the future. Our boss here talks about a shift. Guyana is facing a generation shift, and I think he is, he is right about that. But, but then we have to be alert to that and we, a little bit older, have to give to the, to the young generation the tools to our them to really push forward. Otherwise, we may think that everybody is nice around the world and we are peaceful people. Well, we are, but not necessarily the ones around us will be. Be alert to that. And then what's our responsibility to do that? So this is the point that, that I, I want to make. Look, uh, uh, some years ago, President Kennedy was killed. They created a commission in the U.S. Congress called the Warren Commission. All bright people, all experienced people, all intelligent people, highly educated. So they were together by weeks, this, this study. And then there was this suspicion that could be a conspiracy instead of one shooter. That was Lee Harvey Oswald that was proved to do that. Well, they checked that, that rifle that was used by Lee Oswald. And they said, well, the best shooters need 2.3 seconds to charge the rifle. And then they noticed that three shots had been fired, and then they had this recording movie that uh, a tourist was recording that, and then they recorded that 5.7 seconds passed from the last, from the first to the third shot. They said, well, since we need 2.3 for each one, 6.9 we need for that. So we need to have one more. Well, there is a classical, obvious mistake and this thing, but for weeks, those very intelligent people were discussing that until somebody noticed that, well, the first bullet is already in the chamber. 
boom, 2.3, boom, 4.6, all three shots had been fired. So time enough for doing that. So my point is, and then I have been looking at that, and I see several mistakes. When I was in, still in Brazil, I noticed at one point the president uh, had been invited to uh, join in the, uh, the first Gulf War. Brazil received a letter from the United States to uh, invite Brazil to join that uh, coalition force. And the president called the, the ministers and said that, well, what's the problem here? He said, well, the problem here, they start discussing that, a long description of what was the, the issue there. At one point, everybody was tired. It was Friday in the uh, I mean, late night. Everybody was, the ministers want to go to Rio de Janeiro, not to stay in Brasilia. And, and then at one point, the president was saying, asking, well, hold on. Uh, Argentina is going. Yes, Argentina is going. So we don't go. So this was the first decision was made in this way. I, I witnessed that. The second decision, President, President, we will have a problem in the kitchen because the gas, the liquid gas, we will not have, the, so the gas will disappear from the market. I said, well, what should we do? Let's cut the, the capacity of the bottles of the gas to half. I said, am I listening to that? This is serious, was serious. So uh, this was Friday. On Monday, everybody went crazy buying bottles of it. I had eight in my home, suddenly, because everybody. Then, then the price of the gas was uh, to the skies, and the, it, then it was, uh, uh, I mean, nobody could get that. So uh, the crisis was created for, because of bad decisions. So my point is that governments do bad decisions. What can we do to, to correct that? One of the answers is in the structure. We have to think about the structure. The other is in the academia. Because our political world does not help too much in that. Then we stop here. There's a lot to talk about that. No, that's great. Dr. Betancourt, you said that General Khan said something. Could you read back what he said, what he said there? Let me see. General Khan said, there is a need to replace Guyana structure for a better security standards. There's more to be done. Well, I think it was something else you said, but basically I wanted to just make the point that our national security, our defense and security architecture and strategy um, is based on national security being directly connected to the attainment of national prosperity and national development. So everything we do in the, in the national security, it is not, it is not disengage from what is happening in the economy and national development. And so national prosperity, we are very aware that national prosperity is not about money, it's not about being wealthy, it's about taking the money and creating an environment where every citizen could have, the, could experience and enjoy social justice, social cohesion, enjoy every citizen must have equal access to the opportunities and the issue of creating jobs in the private sector, creating the enabling environment and then particularly very important, the issue of democracy and good governance. And then of course our international relations. When we get those things right and national prosperity becomes a, a reality, then the hardcore issues of, of national security as we know it, the police and the army and the prisons, then those jobs become easy for us. So I just wanted to make a position what General Khan was saying and to expand on that, to say that all of us, as we sit and talk, we understand the mistakes made by other countries that was once in our position, the way they spend the oil money and the way that they sort of diversification of the economy, the way we are going to um, start doing increased defense spending. It is not going to be in an arms race. It is going to be one that is done in a very strategic way um, and is going to be done in, a, in, a, in an environment where democracy, and you did, you did put this, this whole discussion in, a, in the atmosphere of democracy and I would say that everything we do Will, be, will meet the, the litmus test of good governance, transparency, and accountability, and anti-corruption. Uh, I, I just want to add a bit to um, what is said by my two colleagues. Um, I think the research um, or the polls that were referred to by Doc here um, was conducted by the Vanderbilt University. And it our premier law enforcement agency was not rated highly. Um, there was considerable um, concern about its integrity, um, its ability to uphold the rule of law, 
et cetera, et cetera. I, so I think um, quite a lot of focus needs to be given to whether we call it reform, whether we call it restructuring of our premier law enforcement agency. Perhaps also we need to develop the capacity where we can be a bit more predictive of some of the um, emerging threats that will face us. Let me state an example. Um, currently in the Middle East, um, the shipment or the movement of oil faces quite a lot of turbulence. Um, whether it's um, from the Houthis, whether it's from in the Gulf of Aden, wherever. Ghana has now been looked at one of the premier producers of oil. Our nearness to North America um, means that we might soon become the primary supplier of oil to North America. But we need to factor in also the fact that quite a lot of um, persons who fought with ISIS um, have been um, sent back to Trinidad. Trinidad is our neighbors. So perhaps while we focus on the fact that there's terrorist threat in the Middle East, um, Gulf of Aden and all of that, perhaps we need to consider that some of those persons who have already been radicalized may pose a threat to it. But the point I'm making here is that our, in our security sector or defense sector, we perhaps need to be a bit more predictive of what are some of the likely threats that will confront us sooner or later. So um, thank you for, for the great concepts um, from everyone here. Um, what I wanted to draw out um, in particular from, uh, from Ms. Adams, you brought out far more eloquently than I did uh, the important to bring stakeholders to the table for us to be able to see the whole elephant, for us to be able to work through complex issues. Um, and then I really appreciated, you know, the National Security Advisor, Captain Jerry, telling us about the attempts that have been made in the past to get to a solution set for, to be able to move forward in this defense turbulence and then not being able to get to a solution because it got blocked for different reasons. Both of these are important. Because things have been blocked in the past, there may be a tendency to leave it to one sector to make a quick decision because it needs to be done, all right? We see that happening with authoritarian regimes all over the world. Um, we need to open it up, but also in opening that up, we all have a responsibility to try to get to solution sets. We don't just debate to debate. We need to look at the national interest take into account op different perspectives and try to move together toward this. And so I think thinking about this from a peace building framework, thinking about how do we look at mutual interests and mutual solution sets may help us get to our goals. Because if we don't, it's not going to go well. You have amazing opportunities right now. And you have amazing threats right now. And so in this context, you need to open it up and you need to come to decisions. And that means everybody needs to have the same responsibility of saying, how can I contribute to national development? How can I contribute to national defense? And as I contribute, what capabilities do I bring to the table and what can I appreciate from others? And I think if you move in that trend, we're gonna have a lot brighter future here. Thank you for that. I'm so great. Um, grateful that you brought up the fact that like, what can each one of us do? Because I feel many times um, the general public may feel that, okay, this is a decision for the higher ups or the big ones, but it is something, these challenges can affect everyone. It's everyone's business. So I, I believe that even down to the teachers or just the general um, citizen, we need to see or we need to um, 
yes, we need to see how we can play a part in this. For example, I was saying that it's everyone's business, all stakeholders must be involved. Earlier today, um, the Honorable President mentioned that we need to look at the root cause for certain problems. And sometimes these root causes might be in a whole different sector. Maybe we are focusing on the defense sector, but the root cause might be in the educational sector. For example, the President mentioned that in the curriculum we need to introduce new subjects, we need to introduce new topics. So I believe looking at it from this angle is a great way because even the teachers can see, okay, I can play a part in the classroom, I can start having discussions about defense, I can start having discussions about gangs, the guidance counselors can play a part in this. Um, looking at anger management, conflict resolution, these small, these things that we may believe are small can actually um, be very significant later on. So I just wanted to stress that point of how important it is that we look at this collectively and each play a part in combating various challenges. The, um, I also wanted to expand a little bit on the fact that when we sat down together um, to discuss our national security priorities, one of the first things we did was to develop a national security strategy. Um, and this strategy was able to get us all on the common ground, identifying our common values, our common our national principles, and of course, the threats that we face. Um, and so that national security strategy is, it was done about a year and a half ago, but it's now, because of the, dy of, of, of the, 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 the changing dynamic, uh, it is now ready again to be reviewed. But where we are geographically and the threats we are facing, and I make the point that it, one of the biggest threats we are facing is not about a threat against Guyana alone, but the threat is where Guyana is being used as a proxy. Guyana is being used as a proxy to influence global interests in this region. I think if you look at what is happening in Venezuela, with the Iran presence in Venezuela, with the Russians and the Chinese and the Venezuelans and what they are doing, I believe that what we are facing is something a lot bigger, that Guyana is just a staging ground for something a lot bigger. And this makes it important to understand that as we think about the governance and the defense challenges we face, that is why our international partners is so very important, our relationship with the United States, because this is not just about Guyana alone, this is about what happens in this entire region. And we all understand that any one country in this region that becomes a fail or a weak state or a fragile state or a failed state like happened in Haiti, it affects regional stability and security. Venezuela, the challenges in Venezuela have been giving us a headache every day with the, with the non-state actors along our borders that are wrecking havoc on both sides of the borders. Um, and so because of the challenges they face as a country, um, it affects us. And so we are identifying these threats we are identifying them along with our strategic partners, and this is, and we understand very clearly that because of the size of our country and because of the region we are in, these are not things we could deal with alone. Whether we talk about cyber security, whether we talk about port security, um, this is. I just came back from Fort Lauderdale. We had a week-long uh, sem seminar discussing port security and how important it is for the future of Guyana. We we have not even started to touch the tip of the iceberg economically yet. On the, on the proceeds from oil. We are so far behind. People still think, people think that we, are, we, are, we, we have a lot of money, but we don't, not yet. 2030, 2035, the young people of this country would live in such a rich country. You'd have the, the, we'd have so much money, we don't know how to spend it. But we are getting there. And right now, this is the time for us to build, keep our partnership, and keep the region secure for our people to, in, to enjoy the, the, the benefits of the rewards from the oil and all the other things that will come from it in a peaceful environment. And that's what we need to work on in partnership. Yeah, let, let me add a comment and that following, uh, again, uh, what Jerry Govea is saying. There's always an option, Jerry, uh, doing nothing. You can just do nothing. And, and you think that, well, it's nice to have that. Let's uh, let the, 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 the thing go. Uh, the president also used another expression today. He compared uh, the model that you are here developing in a democratic world, and then he used the expression, he compared with the, uh, with the reverse 
authoritarian leadership. He does not want to do this authoritarian leadership. But what you are, you are mentioned that, uh, so you, you chose to understand that your context always required an understanding that development, economic development, is part of your sense of security. Uh, of course, this is a good definition. What my impression uh, gives me from what I have been living with you guys here is that this needs to be more spread within the exchange with the population. With, I mean, to go with uh, Paloma today, uh, Mark, you just mentioned this uh, elephant, the different divisions, and Paloma just mentioned the way to eat the elephant. Let's eat the elephant. There are different ways to eat the elephant. It's true. So there are different ways to address this issue. And, and the, what I think we, we should understand here, if you think about your security, let's be clear here, because now you have the oil. This is a blast. This is a wonderful thing. But immediately, attention of the world comes to you and said, well, you know what? This piece of land here, maybe it's not. Oh, but you know, we are friends. Uh, well, Mr. Chavez once said that we are friends. We are not going to bother you. Uh, it's really, should we believe in that? Uh, and then the, everybody was concerned because then there's the referendum. And then, the refer then I've heard the President Maduro saying that, well, it's not because I want. The people, the Venezuela people, wants that because it's our right to have that. Oh, my gosh. This, go this then, you see, it's, it's piling up. So my point is that if you are concerned here that there is an issue there, there's one option, doing that. The other option, let's build a huge army with uh, rockets and things. You, you know that, I mean, the, 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 the gravitas for that you don't have here. But there are other options that should be act together with that, the, the, what we call the soft power. My sense is that when President Ali decided to go there, make a visit, and, and then he, he used the one tool that he, in his vision or the advice that he got, was a tool that was important at the moment, using the diplomatic tool. Perhaps if you have a clear sense of what is our strategy of that, you could align all the resources that you have to use the media to evolve your Congress. I know the Congress is something very divided here. Could we unify them in, uh, along with this idea that this is critical for the country now because you cannot do by yourself? So there are many tools but those tools are only effective if you put in architecture. If you don't have a sense of where do you want to go, what you want to do with that, if you don't have scenarios, and then you prefer, there's, as, as I said, just let it go. And I think the future then would be uh, really dark for uh, the young people, young generations. So this is the responsibility that I believe we have at this point, or Guyana has at this point. Uh, with, with my outsider perspective. I just wanted to quickly just say that the, our parliament is not divided when it comes to the issue of our threat. Uh, we are very, very united in and out of the parliament, and so there's no ambiguity or questions about where every single Guyanese loyalty and position lies. So our parliament is very, very solid on this matter. I just wanted to make that point to you. Thank you. I, I'm saying that not because this happens only here. You see what we are living in the United States is about the same. And this issue that President Biden has a policy for the immigration and then the policy was actually proposed by Republicans, but now Republicans are not supporting that because this could help. It's part of the political world and the reality. I want to thank, unless there's another intervention by the panel, I want to thank the panel for that first uh, round I intended to introduce a second round, but we're now at five minutes to seven. So I want to invite the, the audience really to chime in, and I just want to use the opportunity, a lot of uh, alignment, both with my sketch of what I think the panel would be and what was said. And uh, I just want to reiterate, Captain Govayo, National Security Advisor, really helped to position the nexus between domestic policy the national priority of prosperity for all Guyanese with, in the first instance, the, uh, the defense policy or defense agenda. But also, he alluded to how that also impacts our foreign agenda, foreign policy. So there's a nexus between domestic policy, 
foreign policy and our um, our uh, domestic policy, foreign policy, and our defense policy. And in so doing, sort of reiterated something the president spoke about today, which is the question about agendas and what agendas influence how we operate as a country. In particular, we sort of alluded to in setting up this architecture, the role of expertise. Where does expertise fall and how do we set up those institutions? And how do we find the right institutional arrangements within the architecture? And I want to thank uh, in particular, Ms. Adams, for her intervention uh, in helping us to understand sort of the socioeconomic basis for a lot of this work and understanding these problems within the context of the political economy. Having said that, I want to open the floor uh, to our audience. Uh, I know this is going to be exciting and I expect that there's going to be several points of conversation both because of the interdisciplinary, near transdisciplinary nature of the topic, but also because it's relevant for right now, for the time that you're in. So I saw two hands shoot up right away. They were ready, ready, ready. Um, so I'm going to circulate the microphone. We're going to take initially two questions. Sir. Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Right, so in the interest of time, because we're just at 7 o'clock and we want to wrap up by 7.30, we're going to take initially two questions from the audience that is here uh, in the uh, lecture theater. We're going to take two online, if there's any online. I want to remind you, as we outlined early, uh, very focused questions uh, around points that were introduced by the, uh, by the panelists, and there's an opportunity in the post-event mingle to address any questions that you don't think uh, was addressed um, by the panelists. All right, so I want to identify. Please uh, say who you are, uh, just briefly. Introduce yourself. Um, <coughs> good afternoon, I'm Courtney A. Bell. I'm a professor of law at the University of Guyana here. Um, we all know what insanity is uh, and looks like and is defined as doing the same thing as a classic definition and expecting a different result. And in that in sense, I want to raise the whole question of political morality. Not constitutional, I teach constitutional law, political morality and how we can shift that away from what clearly has not been working, which is an adversarial kind of political system, which I think I detected was a shared position on the platform, to a more consensus building kind of arrangement. And I, I'll put the question now. Is there any possibility, any possibility at all, that we can lead the world and the region towards the whole concept of shared governance as a solution to the problems that adversarial politics creates, especially in a plural society such as we've got. Thank you, Professor Abel. I invite any member of the panel to uh, respond if they wish to. Sir, I joined this government from the private sector. So I am part of uh, an attempt by the government to be inclusive. There have been other people. And I grew up in the Ghana Defense Force with many, many of my colleagues who serve at this time in the opposition of this country. But unfortunately for me, as a private sector official, 
in 2020, standing in the building and watching politicians being dishonest, blatantly dishonest. They were blatantly dishonest and, and, and presenting fraudulent numbers to the population of this country. And even today, you still have these people who are in our opposition that calling the U.S. ambassador white devil, that is calling the government and install government by the United States. And so until we have a, a discussion that is based on the truth, on integrity, and let us move forward, but every time, and I agree with you, I believe and I work every day uh, for us to be inclusive, and I want us to be inclusive. But if I have to sit around a table and a person look at me in my face and tell me what I saw in 2020, I was a crazy person, I cannot work with you. I have a problem with you. I have a problem with integrity. When we start talking about shared governance, it's got to start from a position where all of us around this table have the best interests for Ghana in, at heart, and we're dealing on a position of integrity and trust and goodwill. Thank you. Great question. Uh, shared governance. I don't think um, our constitution makes provision for shared governance. Our representation system provides for, as we call it, winner takes all. And so, unless we develop a greater sense of political maturity, um, perhaps what you are suggesting is possible. If we review this, the political landscape over the years, we have had added to our two major political parties elements from civil society. We have had the PNCR, or the reform. Um, we have had the PPPC, civic. I think um, those were attempts to either broaden the sense of representation among um, the populace, or perhaps to display to the populace that there were some attempts to be inclusive. But what we have noticed also is that as time progressed, we have lost or we have seen um, diminishingly um, those elements that were added. And so I think unless and until um, there's a greater sense of political maturity, um, we move beyond platitude and we demonstrate clearly that we really want to move ahead. I agree with the advisor that we all need to develop the sense that where we want to put Guyana first and not just say we are putting Guyana first, where we demonstrate that Guyana is first above our politics, only then I think that what you're saying might perhaps become a fleeting reality. Professor, uh, this question is a question for an entire course of political science, and it's quite an interesting <laughs> question, absolutely. Uh, so I, I cannot talk about, comment about the Guyan reality because I don't know enough about that. But uh, uh, theoretically, uh, I am very realistic in the way I approach that. I think that we as human beings are basically uh, flawed people. Original sin, if you want. But uh, the solution then for institutional democracy, and you, you, we have heard this, this morning how democracy is under attack everywhere. And, and we see that, and one of the issues is morality, of course. Uh, but I think in the end, we tended to uh, accept, I tended to accept in value what happened there in America when James Madison, for example, said that, look, uh, we are all uh, vicious people, ambitious people. There's only one thing that everybody has. We are ambitious. So we have to create a system in which my ambition controls the ambition of Jerry, and ambition of Jerry is controlled by ambition of Mark and Bill. So we, this, is model, this is a model. So basically we are saying that we need institutions. Because if you are, I mean, let free, we will do bad things. This is the reality. This also applies, I believe, to the concept of states that Jerry mentioned slightly here. 
Uh, in the end, I think states are, have interests. They don't have friends or no friends. They have interests. When interests converge, and sometimes interests are in the same principles. So when principles converge, we can have cooperation, friendship. Uh, we are seeing now this issue in, in Ukraine and, and, and Russia. Uh, and then we see that uh, the, my money as a U.S. taxpayer is now moving to Ukraine to help them defend. And uh, frankly, I'm happy with that because those, those uh, uh, principles, they are in conformity with my principles. Then my sense is that uh, we need those institutions. And for as much as this can be a complicated issue, we may be frustrated sometimes. I see some people getting out of jail because of approved corruption scandals and then becoming president with the judicial system saying that, wow, this is, guys are right. And then I get disappointed with that, as probably you are. But I mean, in the end, this is the system. So we have to believe that uh, the principles will, will preserve. And as Madison said, what we need is a system in which, because we're not the, we are not the angels, so we need ambition. one ambition controls the other, so checks and balances. I keep believing in that. And the only <clears throat> intervention that I would add to, to what's already been said here, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. Um, we need a form of shared governance to function. What do I mean by that? There needs to be a level of civility and a level of cooperation with whichever government is in power in order to keep moving in a path. And if we don't do that, then what we see is the next government comes in and then their, their stuff is sabotaged by the opposition. And then the opposition gets in and then there's, and, and after a while, policy doesn't matter, visions don't matter, it's all just about win or lose politics. And we talked a lot here about the importance of institutions. So if I build a house, great house, well built, and then there's a new government and I tear it down and I build a new house. And then there's a new government and I tear it down and I build a new house. There's no staying power there. So how do we build institutionality? You build instit we build institutionality with state policy, not just government policy. And state policy requires broader based engagement and broader based buy-in. But it also means that opposition parties need to not just politicize. We need to try to work forward on mutual gains. And, and that's how you get to a sustainable solution set. And it's difficult because sovereignty is messy and politics is even messier, all right? But we gotta try. We have to try to collaborate. I, I, I just wanted to, to make the point about common values and common principles. One of the things that bind Guyana to the United States and to our Western partners at this time is our shared common values and our shared common principles of democracy, respect for the rule of law, respect for fair and free elections, respect for human rights and good governance, and so on and so on. And even as we attempt to talk about working together, to work with anyone, whether it's a business partnership or a political partnership, it's got to be done where there are common values and common principles that we share together. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your responses. I do want to emphasize that we, um, we want to ensure that we uh, keep the conversation in the framework of the topic. Um, and although there are broad issues, um, uh, Captain Gavaya did say that one of the things that is most important in the topic that we're talking about here, and to the point of shared governance that we're talking about, is the sense of a shared set of priorities for Guyana's national defense and security. And I think that this is the overarching question uh, when we talk about shared governance, and hence the reason the question flowed in that particular way. Um, I want to invite you, sir, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, my name is Dr. Randy Poussard. I am actually a member of the faculty here. And uh, I see um, my brother up there. I'm actually Professor Emeritus at the 
School of International Service, American University, where I taught for a quarter of a century. It's good to, good to see a colleague. Um, Ms. Adams, I think you're on to something. Um, there's a, the, the Copenhagen School, first articulated by Barry Buzan in 1995 in a famous book called People, States, and Fair. I think it could be usefully developed. Um, but now in this balance between security studies from Washington, D.C. and the academic side, and uh, as a former assistant director of the Center for International and Strategic Studies in Toronto, where I worked with the Defense Department in Canada, NATO and the United Nations, I have a question about hegemonic leadership in the Caribbean. And it concerns, first of all, um, the lack from Canada. Canada is very involved in the Caribbean and oftentimes in Latin America, but it's not involved in you know, sufficient engagement in the provision of security. And I want to ask the question about the United States. The United States has tremendous capability consistent with its interest and its history of involvement in Caribbean and Latin America. The thing is, it also has a legitimacy issue because its form of entry and participation has not always been welcomed. And so the thing is, how do you, to use an Anthony Giddens term, a structuration of American participation, what form would hegemonic regional leadership take? How, through what modalities and through what architectural architecture would the United States be an active participant along with Canada in an inter-American redesign system? I, I, I have, there's a subsidiarity model. And the thing is, the Caribbean people, we produce the boots on the ground. You provide the logistics some of the finance, the intelligence, and the, the heavy lifting in, in movements and good, of goods and material and so on and so forth. Um, I would very much like to hear your, your views on this. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. We've got academics in the room. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> All right, wonderful to see you. When I, when I saw you walk in, I remember a time together at American University, so it's fantastic to see you. Um, um, this is difficult. It's messy. Um, I find myself on different grounds here. I've, I've taught at American University. I currently work for the United States Department of Defense. That was a very difficult step for me based on my background, what I'd studied, where I'd worked. But at my current job, I teach multidimensional security where I talk about development, environment, things like that with senior political leaders, defense leaders, security leaders from the Americas. At the same time, um, we do this in a shared governance framework. So I'm given by the Department of Defense to the Inter-American Defense College. It's housed in Washington. But my boss, my chief of studies, is Mexican. My vice director is Brazilian. We speak four languages. And as we engage, there's no doctrinal framework. So I have a student from Guyana that is there. He gets just as much voice as the Americans in my classroom. And I don't teach American doctrine. We say, how do we deal with shared security challenges? Go, figure it out together. And what are some of the challenges faced? An open debate and engagement, because that's what we want to do in a democratic society. And I think we know that the idea of the United States going alone or being unipolar, that's not happening and probably didn't work very well in the first place. What we do have now is we have leaders, smart, smart people in all of our countries that want to contribute to the betterment of their societies. And we are in a shared governance frame. 
where you fail, we have costs. Where we fail, you have costs. We have interdependence. Sometimes asymmetric, sometimes complex, but we are all embedded together. And so we need to find ways to work together. And I think the idea of building trust, it's not easy. We need to be as transparent as possible. We need to build relationships. We need to move on these things. We need to use academia to help us have dialogues that are difficult to have in a state level. It's because I work in academia that I can talk about a little bit, all right? I'm not an ambassador, but hopefully I can contribute. Dr. Bittencourt can contribute. Everyone here in this panel, that we all have linkages with states. As we do that, how can we open dialogue, open engagement, and try to work together towards solutions to very complex issues? And, and sometimes we need to be involved with people we don't like. That's part of negotiation. So we need to work together and find ways. Well, uh, I have a slightly different perspective from, from Mark. Uh, he said that he speaks for different governments. I mean, I speak for no government. I work for the U.S. government, but the U.S. government is not responsible at all for the things I'm saying here. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Just some points that is my own thinking on that. I think your question is quite to the mark. Uh, my sensation is that the variable Guyana is new. The, the relevance of the variable Guyana in the region is new. Uh, the fact that the oil is changing entirely the equation in the region. And the, uh, the, the usual architecture that we had is not working. Multilateralism is not work, did not work with, uh, with Venezuela. Sanctions did not work with Venezuela, working partially, but creating these herds of uh, people escaping from there, and then the region has to accommodate that, so it's creating all kinds of uh, difficulties. So multilateral, multilateralism not working. The Inter-American Defense Board, when, when we have those delegates, is also tied up without having solutions for this new variable. When I say new variable, it's a good thing, but then it's, we, we know what we are talking about. This is creating all these other uh, interests in the region, along the region. So my sensation is that sanctions do not work. Uh, multilateralism do not work. What is in the U.S. interest in the, is, is stability. Uh, in the U.S., in my perspective, there's no interest in having conflicts in the region. And the, in terms of principle, we, I think the U.S. perceives that uh, there, are, there are rights that were acquired by Guyana a long time ago. So these things is go are going to be discussed in international tribunals. I think this will be supportive. And uh, I think most of the discussions will be in terms of uh, signals the uh, signalization in the international courts, in the, in the wording, in the media, uh, announcing that, uh, yes, we are strong in, in the diplomatic support of those decisions. First of any other thoughts, I believe this will be important, the signalization that we'll be watching those things. And I think we have to live with that. In that sense, I believe Canada is trying to play a more important role in the international board. Um, there's always some concern in, in how much you engage those people. The preference would be uh, about using people from the same region. I believe Brazil should have an important role, and Brazil has been classically uh, a country pledging for peace in their national security place. There's this thing that Brazil is a peaceful country for tradition and conviction. Uh, so it's an important player and has been, has a history of cooperation. So I believe that for Guyana, it will be important to play with those cards so far, diplomatically, being active, but must be very active. Internally, I believe, I don't know, I'm not tracking the media here, but I would say that this is the time for you guys to go to the media, explain to the population, engage. Society should be discussing that. What is this? What this means for us in reality? What is the strategic concern with the art? Engaging the, the people, think tanks. The creation of this national defense institute should be should have some role in that. So, I think you are in the words of the idea so far, and it's it will be better for the future if you can win the battles of ideas 
before getting to the battles of our weapons. Well, thanks. We have two questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hamilton and Dr. Bittencourt. Um, and thank you, Dr. Prasad, for your question, which was, uh, was, was very, very necessary and useful, especially as we dis discuss sort of institutional arrangements. We have a question online uh, from Mr. George Benson and sort of relates to this multi-dimensionality that uh, Dr. Hamilton spoke about. His question at the core of resiliency, really. Is there any thought to what our various defense infrastructures need to start focusing on in view of the long-term predictions of climate change and sea level rise and other issues that affect um, resilience in this part of the world? It's open to anybody who wants to start on that. Yes. It's within a Caribbean structure, but just globally, engaging with um, what are we dealing with within climate? We're seeing effects everywhere. I think some of the effects are more acute uh, within the Caribbean, but in, in my classes and as I engage with students, um, especially my students coming from Caribbean nations, um, coming from particular parts of the world, they say this is our number one concern. Um, and so I think it, it varies, but the idea that we need to pay attention to it is, is, is just yes. And I think the Perry Center is, is trying to play a lead role with this. Yeah, George Benson is a, a good friend, is also a professor, he cooperates with the Perry Center in several programs with the Caribbean. So thank you, George, for the question. Uh, yes, the Perry Center is very concerned about that. We have stellar professors de dealing with that. Uh, my auto self-criticism is the following. I have a sensation that we have been uh, able to describe the problem that has been with us for over 50 years. We described the different fa facets of, of the crime, organized crime, and jail system, and all the things that create crime, but we are failing in discussing solutions for the problem. Some solutions have been tried, uh, in Rio, they tried this UPP solution with the pol uh, police, pacify police things. Um, we have been exchanging more information between police, but we have been failed dramatically. And, and the, the number of seizures that we have, the numbers of uh, in, in, uh, uh, criminals that are now being arrested, but it, the, the thing is always growing. And the, in my view, we are failing to discuss what are the effective ways to better fight that? Because this is a war we are, we are losing for a long time. And this is, well, it's associated to drugs, yes. It's, it's all linked. But see, for example, what's happening in Haiti now, there is a criminal component in, behind that. How do we deal with that? And we try several times to deal with that. So this is one of the uh, critical issues that we have in the region. Yes, in the Paris Center, we have been trying that. I think we, we need to do better in now trying to assess solutions that have been trying, see why they failed at some time. And, and go, I mean, beyond the platitude to say, well, the, you know, the political environment was not favorable. I mean, this is not an answer. Give me a break. Of course, there is always political interest, but we have to know why we have this issue and why we have been able to describe so well the, the, the causes and the rationale, but we have been failing as institutions in addressing the solutions. So not a good answer, but just to dramatize the, the, the problem that we have. Thank you, Dr. Betancourt. Um, and in a sense, you preempted with your response the next question. Um, and this question I want to, with the permission of the the person who posted the question, Captain uh, Kevon Lewis, I want to, um, to break it up into two, two distinct questions. The first part builds on what, on what you talked about, and which is how do we effectively engage through these structures and these agendas, young people, one, as a sector that needs attention, uh, that is because of the impacts of the life cycle, the youth life cycle, 
on their own performance, their own lives, and then how that feeds into uh, society, such as in the case of gangs and so on. But also, as Captain uh, talks about it here, this question of succession planning, uh, this, this idea of building, building towards the future. And here he references President Ali's uh, presentation and sort of challenge to the university and to all of us to set up a program on hemispheric and security studies within the CXC community. So I'm asking the question in the context of youth engagement, youth participation, but from two standpoints. One is a sector that needs attention, a sector uh, that needs investment, uh, and a sort of sectoral response within the broader national security infrastructure, but also how do we then prepare leaders who are going to be future leaders in national defense and national security? This is open to the panel. Well, I think, um, I think the president himself um, spoke this morning about the Defense Institute, about the, the now there's a bigger focus on, on strategic development studies, which a big component of that is defense, um, the, the defense discipline. And I think the fact that now we are looking to do it into the schools, in terms of succession planning, um, and even now at the level of the, of the Ghana Defense Force and their training of officers, the whole training of officers has moved far beyond just military tactics and strategy. There's a big academic, pro academic component to that. And so I think we are preparing the young people for leadership um, in a very effective way. Um, so I'm, I am not, I'm not particularly worried at this time about our succession planning and the strategies that is employed. Just to add to what Captain <laughs> said, I believe that a sector that we need to pay strong attention to right now is um, the IT sector in terms of cyber, cyber threats and the cyber crimes that we are relatively new um, facing. Uh, I remember maybe like four years, I'm relatively young, so I can't speak how <laughs> many, many, <laughs> yes. Many, a uh, couple of years ago, four or five years ago, I don't think, well, we did not pay that much attention to cyber threats as we did now. Now we have the emergence of AI, you see a huge emergence of spams, hacking, things that we are not very used to. And so I believe that this is a sector or, a, you know, something that we need to pay attention to encourage more persons to join this, encourage more persons to focus on cybersecurity, be more adept, and just not persons focusing, but um, spreading awareness about it. I think information, information is out there, but it comes down to is it available and accessible to all parts of the population. I just want to touch on something very quickly. For example, um, hackers, they prey on the most vulnerable, for example, our elderly. It's a position, uh, population often forgotten, but sometimes, you know, the elderly may not be as tech savvy as other persons, and you see they are victims to hacking, spam, things like that. So that's why it comes down to disseminating information to all levels of the population, regardless of their background, technological competencies, things like that. Are we, um, inform as I said, information is out there, but are we making it uh, our duty to get it to all different parts of the region? For example, um, from a social service point of view, sometimes we go down into the market, go down into the homes, go down into the post office where you can find a different diaspora of persons. So I just wanted to touch on that real quick. I just want to add a bit to what Ove said. Um, I think the youthful part of our population is about 60, 60 something percent. And um, I think at a national level, not just security, all sectors, we need to find a way how to engage and to have them a part of the national discourse dialogue. I think the issue has to do with quite a lot of our young people, despite the large segment, they're not 
matriculating. They're not moving on. So we have, uh, while the population of our young people are quite large, um, there's a difficulty in having them develop um, cognitive skills, the technical skills, and all of that. Um, the president pointed to some of the issues today. Um, while it will be an onerous task on the university, I think it has to go way into our secondary level, primary and secondary level. Um, the university receives what is produced and delivered by those two levels. And so I think the focus has to be placed um, even more seriously at the primary level. Um, it's not just good to say that we have a large um, youthful population, but how do we engage them? How do we utilize some of the skills? For example, um, the, the millennials, the generation Zers, they think differently to the baby boomers. And so it, it, it is going to pose a real serious challenge on us as leaders. How do we merge? How do we um, utilize what they bring to the table? Baby boomers like you and I, I mean, <laughs> we are not so technically savvy as they are. I mean, um, if I may say, um, we were born with our heads first, I think, most of us. But the, but the generation Z, as they're born with their fingers first, so they are more technically savvy. And so at the national level, I think, the conversation has to be, how are we going to bring to bear those skills that they have to offer? So <clears throat> I love this topic. My doctoral research was on why young people join arm movements. Um, but in addition to that, the idea of why do young people matter in society. And now I'm old, um, older. But in that context, why do we need to value young people? Because nothing happens anywhere without young people. There's no movement, economic, political, social, without young people involved, it goes nowhere. I like to talk about young people as the engine of any social change. They're not always the engineers. Someone else might be riling it up, but young people are going to be what's gonna bring it. So if we do not invest into young people, what's the point? And if we're trying to build a secure future for young people, but don't involve them in thinking about that security, what's the point? So I'm a huge advocate in engaging young people. I think the other piece to this question, so I think in terms of moving it in certain levels, primary, secondary level, it's fantastic to start thinking about and having people think about this idea. The other piece is we need to be creative. A lot of my research looked at why do young people join gangs and why do young people join militant movements. I was in Sri Lanka, I was in Central America, and did a lot of research on the ground and engagement. So what, we, what I found and what we find in the literature is young people join these for a number of different reasons, but ultimately the bad actors are better at it than we are because they give young people more ownership. They give more young people more to do, they give them more status, and they give them more credit. And in our systems, we tell them what they need to do. And so finding ways to get youth ownership, youth engagement, and it's hard. Sharing power is hard. We've already been talking about that in other ways. But sharing power in a classroom, sharing power in governance structures is tough. But getting youth involved is fantastic. Quick compliment on that. I'm aligned with those ideas, Ms. Adams and, and Lee and, and Mark. But I want to bring you one specific point here. I think no child is, uh, I mean, is born a criminal. The childs are innocent, the children are innocent, so we are creating those criminals. Our society is creating that. Number one, because there are no jobs. If you go around, you see these uh, hundreds of young kids around with no, nothing to do. They have no opportunities, no job, no, no uh, I mean, public and civil or entrepreneurial sector able to provide jobs and the government does not have this in their equation 
uh, it is a bad thing because they will go to crime. It's easier. It, it's, uh, it's easier. It's romantic to go to crime. So uh, Dr. Dave Spencer and I had a chance. I'm not, uh, you may know Dave Spencer is our colleague at the Paris Center. And once at the beginning of the, of the UPPs in Rio, we, they, we had a chance to visit there. They took us in the helicopter first to see the dimension of the problem. All those favelas disorganized, and when you look at that from the high, you see, wow, the police has a very difficult job here. This is the reality. And then we, they, they put us in the top of one of the mountains there. In that community live about 10,000 people. It's called Santa Marta. In this favela, uh, we had a chance then to go down. It was, there was an unity of pacifying police there, so they would have social events there. There was a daycare center, and the ladies taking care of the daycare were ladies from the community, and they have over 400 children there. So we had a chance to go there and talk to the ladies, and I was talking to the lady that was cooking a huge pan with black beans and then happy to do that. I was talking to her, well, you're happy here. Yes, I am. So uh, how many do you have your kids here? Yeah, I have three here. And, the, and you have some more? Yes, I have three at home, because they are already above the age to be here. I said, oh, really? So yeah, they're, they're with my oldest son. And they said, what, you, are you happy with that? Oh, yes, of course, they have this, this thing here. They have uh, activities here. They have the food here. We can help. So the, she was proud of that. And said, what is your major concern? is, well, when my old son gets to the streets, because immediately the drug gangs will get him, and they have no other way, because there are no jobs for them. I mean, he will be out. And then the, so it, see, this is a normal lady, and she was talking about a future criminal. And then the police was not prepared for that. But the origin of the problem was this is the lack of opportunity, lack of, lack of work for that. And why, I can tell you why this model stopped working. The, the governor of Rio de Janeiro at that time, well, first, crime is a local state case of responsibility. It's not federal government. Every candidate to, to the federal position will announce and defend the crime. We are going to fight crime. And the moment they receive the presidential uh, sash, they forget that because this is not a, it's a dirt case. And so they say, well, this is responsibility of the states. So uh, the governor on that occasion is in jail because of uh, corruption, about many millions of dollars. This guy is still in jail. Well, he's not, he's now out of jail, just using one of the, one, those things. The governor that was creating the UPP is in jail. So what kind of example we have? Then the, the thing failed because of these several cases. It's a compound problem. And how do we resolve that? I think it should be a common solution. We should create a major movement in the region that every state recognize this is a problem. It's easy for us in, in the southern region to say that, well, the problem of drugs is our Americans, because if you stop using drugs, then the, it's not only that. I mean, let's be honest here. And I think we need a major recognition that this is a big issue for the entire region. And the, the sad news I have in terms of the future, in terms of scenario for Guyana, is that when your economy is getting better and better, fortunately, this problem will be worse for you. I guarantee you. Thank you so much. And uh, I was uh, forced to reflect on my own life. Uh, in response to that, in your responses to the question. Um, and, uh, you know, you mentioned, Dr. Hamilton, your work with young people and your, and your focus of your research, your, your doctoral research. I had the honor as a young person at 13 years old getting involved in a youth organization. And given the community that I came from, you know, it was significant uh, in my development. I went on to work for the United Nations uh, after that, and just uh, there's two points that I want to make quickly. One, we used to talk about the demographic bonus as a concept in population studies uh, in UNFPA, and Guyana was experiencing what we call a demographic, demographic bonus, which is 
this idea that the young population outnumbers the dependent population, and the dependent population, of course, are those below 15 and those above 65, and that that posed an opportunity. But the, the flip side of that, it also posed a significant security challenge. So in my role at the time as a special youth fellow, the headquarters in, uh, for, for the UNFPA, we were looking at programs in Latin America and the Caribbean. Incidentally, I visited Ecuador. Uh, and this question about gangs, uh, there used to be in Ecuador something called Casas de Juventud, or uh, youth houses, loosely translated. And here we implemented some of those strategies too. That work that we learned about it, gangs in Ecuador, and what we learned also in Belize that had a similar problem. At the time I was part of a, we call it an interagency task force, uh, conservative proliferation of small arms. So we were looking at gangs in Belize. We're looking at these examples from Ecuador. And one of the things was this idea of, of family and security and stability that gangs give people, give young people. And we see what is happening right now in Ecuador, just to mention, right? You know, when I visited Ecuador in 2000, and I'm not gonna age myself, but a while ago, right, as a young person, and visited those communities, and visited those youth houses, and we see immediately in our lifetime, in my lifetime, and not so distant past, how gangs became significant in a destabilization of a country. Uh, so I just want to leave that there. Uh, I'm not a security expert, though, and I have several uh, you know, <laughs> youth experiences that I'm grateful for. Uh, I do want to invite one last comment, two comments. <laughs> we are a little bit over. We're, we're more than a little bit over, but we'll make up, I promise. I want to invite, please introduce yourself um, and share your comment. Hello, my, my name is Michelle King, and I work on security sector reform with the Guyana Police Force. So my background is City of London Police, I was chief officer there. The youth problem is a multi-dimensional problem. And coming uh, to Ovi's comment can range from failure management within other services, other public services. So what you have with defense and policing is a failure in the education services results in young people leaving education very early. So that's why that becomes a pathway to the streets, okay? We put in place youth offending teams to actually address pupils that actually leave education early. We don't see the whole thing as a problem though, because the youth present an opportunity for the state, which if not managed, the youth can actually destabilize government. If you look at what's happening in the UK, the youth are driving a lot of the, gen the agenda around changes in gender, pronouns, he, she, them, they, okay? When we look at what happened with the Arab Spring, that was young people. If you look at what's going on in social media, that is young people. We set up social media teams, okay, which young people look after for the police. We set up national cyber security academies, which are probably managed 100% by young people because they are IT savvy, okay? So we see young people as a big opportunity. They're the leaders of the future. They're not necessarily a problem. They're only a problem if you don't manage them. So when we think about climate change and we see young people saying, this is our future that you are damaging. You know, looking, they're looking back at our generations of baby boomers, people born in the 60s and the 50s and saying, look what you've done to the planet. You've left us nothing. So their voices are becoming stronger. 
So they are our allies. And engaging them is not as hard as you think. You just have to be more imaginative. Even with apprenticeships, a lot of people have seen what's going on in Guyana, young people, and they want to be part of this story. How do they become part of this narrative? By including them in oil and gas apprenticeships. That is one way. By introducing more STEM subjects, that's science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So I used to, I used to teach at university in London, okay? Engineering, mathematics. Encouraging them to get into those subjects. Again, technology, big one with young people, particularly in defense, as I said, cyber, cyber crime, social media, listening to chatter. A lot of fraud management, cryptocurrency, all of this area is really effectively managed in the UK by young people. So they are a success story, they're not a problem, but you just have to bring them in in, the, you know, in a cohesive way instead of seeing them as something to be managed. And I think Ovi's, Ovi's point, very, very important, failure management within other public services leads to a huge demand in the guy in the police force. We cannot be health, we cannot be social services, we cannot be education. We can only manage policing. And that means failure management needs to be contained and accountability addressed. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. My name is Adrian Galenick. I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission at the U.S. Embassy here in Guyana. And um, I think as part of this conversation, it's really important to also recognize the role of women and other historically marginalized groups in democracy go and governance and also in defense institutions. And throughout history and today in the United States, we definitely face significant challenges with underrepresentation of women and also historically, other historically uh, marginalized groups in defense in the United States. And I believe that it's also a problem that um, the Western Hemisphere also shares with us, as we are also part of the Western Hemisphere, of course. Um, but my challenge to um, the University of Guyana and to the Inter-American Defense College and the Perry Center, and I would expand this to all defense institutions of, of higher learning, professional military education, is to recognize um, and very purposefully look at the curriculum and the role that women and other historically marginalized groups have played in the history of um, conflict, but in the history of finding solutions. And um, I think recognizing that um, is part of um, addressing it in the future. And I would challenge anyone who has gone through a United States professional military education system to tell me um, if they know um, that uh, on war, Klaus Karl von Clausewitz is on war, we should really be thanking a woman for that because it wouldn't exist if it weren't for her. His, his wife published it, um, and it wouldn't exist without her, and he entrusted her to do that. So that's my final comment. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. This is a great point. I mean, I have to advertise a little bit at the Paris Center, because it, it, this is one program that the, the Paris Center has been promoting for a long time, Women in Peace and Security. Uh, also, we are glad to see in our region, the defense establishment, more and more women, including one of our bosses there, I mean, General Richardson in South Korn. He is a very strong woman. And so I'm glad to say that the, the Paris Center is, is doing a great job in that, too. Thank you. I fully agree with you. By, you. by the way, who commands my house is a strong woman. <laughs> thank, thank you very much um, for your intervention, and thank you, Dr. Bittencourt, for your response. Uh, we're just at 10 minutes uh, to the hour, so we do want to uh, move on very quickly. Um, I want to, without delay, really, introduce, and I was going to by time, but I see uh, DVC Cummings is here. DVC Cummings is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Guyana with responsibility for academic engagement. Uh, there is a subunit also uh, that is developing within that unit, 
uh, that DVC can speak to. DVC Cummings is no stranger to our landscape. Um, he is well accomplished in his field. He is very much well known in the medical sciences. DVC Cummings will give uh, and raise vote of thanks on behalf of the university. Uh, sorry, closing remarks on behalf of the university. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, pleasant good evening to all of you. I think we've spent the entire day talking about security, and that indeed indicates the importance of this important subject um, to us in the country, in the region, and the world at large, as we are in the presence of a number of um, military um, engagement across the world. And we ourselves in Guyana, not so long ago, were at the brink of such an engagement. And so we do value sincerely this discussion. I do think that the University of Guyana is extremely grateful for having this discourse, for having all of these experts here. Um, if I can recall their names, I have the names written somewhere. Um, Dr. Louis Bedingcourt from the Perry Center, um, Dr. Hamilton from the U.S. Defense College, um, retired Colonel Wilbert Lee, um, our own and distinguished expert in the aviation and, and, and security, Captain Major Jerry Gavaya. <laughs> Well, you come here, Captain and Major, at the same time. We call you Captain because of aviation duties, but you were, uh, we told that you were also a Major. And the woman among us, our social worker, Uva Adams, and also this morning itself, um, it's all been discoursed about security, and it shows how important this subject is to us here at the University of Guyana. Now, I've been asked to give some closing remarks to this discussion. And what I did, I always like to go to the, you know, I felt that the United Nations, there was a reason why the United Nations was created after the Second World War um, and because of what the world was in the 40s and so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the 40s in the 20s. And so the United Nations, to my mind, always try to provide guidance, Vice Chancellor, to us in the way we act. And, I, and, and the, all of the discussions that we had all evening and all day, when I looked at the United Nations, there are 17 sustainable goals. And I think every country, their developmental strategy is pattern or is informed by the United Nations Sustainable Goal. And even at the university, in the context of what we do, it is also, we try as much as possible to keep very close. I looked at the 17 goals and there are two that deals with issues of security. It shows the importance at the level of the United Nations. So what we're saying is not out of line. It's in keeping in the context of the guidance that has been provided by the United Nations. Now, when I looked at the SDG 11, it says it makes cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And goal number 16 speaks about promote peaceful, right? promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development and provide access to justice for all and build access that's inclusive of industries at all levels. So those are the two, the two goals that I would have identified that speaks directly and indirectly to security. Our conversation that we had today um, speaks about, a lot has been said about the factors um, that has contributed to 
the, the team that we have, challenges for defense governance in a turbulent world, um, the issue of um, the, the last point raised about youth substance, you know, the Caribbean region is a major region for substance, for trafficking, um, for substance abuse, and we know how that is related to many of the other issues of violence and, and all the implications and all the other security challenges that do come with that. Um, just to go back briefly to, just to speak a bit more with respect to SDG 16, some of the targets is to reduce all form of violence related deaths, right? Everywhere, and everywhere, you know, one of the things, when, um, I think in the, when the United Nations were putting together these goals, they speak about everywhere. They meant in the developed world, in the underdeveloped world, they, they're also referring to Haiti, what happens in the, 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 the quality of, of life that we have in Europe, we also have that in Haiti and in the rest of the world. So reduce all from the violence and death rates everywhere. Promote the rule of law, right? At the national and international levels and ensure equal access and justice for all. I do think that our discussion, and I don't want to say specifically, why is it taking place in the university? Why is it taking, why this is not happening at Camp Ghana? Why is it not happening, happening um, at, Waller, at, at one of our military, but it's occurring at the university? It is because, I do think because of the challenges we have with our security, we are seeking a response from the educational sector. I do think that education, um, there are several things we can see about education. It changed lives. It makes a difference in the way we behave. And, I, and, and my own definition of, of, of education is that the educated means that there's a change of life, the change in the way you think, right? A change in behavior. If there's no change in behavior, there's no education. It means that it's expected from our panelists and from, from the institute of itself and all the, and all the military and security experts we have in the room, they have approached the educational sector the, the educational institute and the premier tertiary education institute in the country because they feel that we should have a response to, to, to address a lot of the challenges that have been discussed all day today. And so, Director, I think you have a great challenge to ensure from two aspects, teaching and research. There's a lot of opportunities, all that we'll discuss this afternoon, do, should, um, should should work as a, as a platform for, for the designing of curriculum, all the discussions that we have all day, the way we reform our curriculum to address issues of security so as to make a difference, so that we can have that change of behavior among our people, but also research. There is so much of research um, that, um, that, 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 that from, 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 the, from these kinds of discussions. And those are the two things that I think will make us can make our society um, a much safer and a much better place for us to, to survive. And just in closing, I just wanted to um, go to one of the um, issues, one of the things that I would have prepared here. And I just want to address directly the military or the or security um, forces that, that it's not I do not see this as a, a target only for the security forces. There's a lot of, we talk about multi-sectoral approach. All of the elements that um, challenges our security, it's not just for the military. It's not just a, a function, but the entire um, spectrum of, um, and so within the university, it involves environmental sciences, it involves the natural sciences, it involves the medical sciences, agriculture, talk about food security, um, all, all aspects. And so we should try as much as possible to keep that interdisciplinary approach. The problem with the military is that let's hope that this discussion will, 
will cause the relevant reformation of the military. A lot of the, the skills that are needed are really outside of the military and not in the military itself. And so I am happy to see that the Institute has engaged persons with the military to have them trained with the relevant skills. And I do see this as another opportunity for professionalizing the military and, and giving them the kind of um, know-how, the skills, in order to address the complex um, matter of, um, of security that we have as a people. So I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity for just sharing these comments with you. I myself have learned um, so much extensively today, and it's, it gives me greater understanding. I've learned from all of these experts here, and, and also those that are um, within the, those questions that were asked. Um, and, and indeed, it helped me to under, have a greater understand of the multi-sectoral approach as, as to how we address matters of security, and it's not just the role of the military, it is the role of everyone. Security is like you say, um, um, whatever is, is everybody's business, security is everyone's business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DVC Cummings. And I saw DVC coming, he said the thing, it made me chuckle. He said, uh, you need to professionalize the military. And I said that moment instinctively. And all of our guys on the panel know what it means, and particularly for the National Security Advisor, who said that part of that question is the question of budget. And uh, for those of you who are not Guyanese, <laughs> let the dollars rain, the cheese, the cheese, to ching to ching This is what that means. <laughs> So um, thank you very much, DVC uh, Cummings, for your intervention and your advocacy. I'm sure the military people here appreciate that. I want to invite, once again, uh, Ms. Hopkinson. OK. All right, well, fair enough. We want to thank everybody. Then I'll do it. On behalf of Ms. Hopkinson, um, uh, she's signaling that we're at the end of time, and indeed we are. We have asked you, we asked you for five minutes more. We took. 25 minutes. I, uh, I, I said I had many experiences as a young person, but one of those was in good governance, institutional strengthening, institutional strengthening training, and so on. So I always like to say we have to ask permission if we take more time. So I, I, I'm glad that you did not revolt uh, by leaving and you stayed through. We want to thank you for being an excellent audience. The questions were particularly instructive for the way forward, and the panel demonstrated that they are more than talented that they are indeed experts in this area, um, and that expertise is an important part of building strong institutions. I want to thank all of our panelists, but especially I want to thank uh, our lone female panelists, uh, Ms. Ove Adams, uh, Ove or Ove, all right, uh, Adams. Yes, please give her a round of applause. We did an excellent job and brought perspectives to some of the issues that I think we might have overlooked Otherwise, um, I want to thank the panel. I want to thank all of you for being excellent. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor, the Vice Chancellor's office, uh, for first the Vice Chancellor for her excellent leadership and vision with respect to these issues. And the office of the Vice Chancellor, uh, all of the people who support that vision, um, and in particular for this event, the people in the office space who are not here, some of them, but especially I want to recognize Tara, who's had a very long day, is going to have a very long week. I want to identify Siobhan, uh, um, Tara, Cheryl, who had to leave, um, Christine, Trevano, uh, Yasmin, who is here, and Latoya, who are really uh, the people who you don't get to see often, but who make these things possible. <laughs> and finally, I want to thank our guests um, from the Perry Center, uh, the National Defense, Defense University, uh, the Inter-American Defense College, um, and all of our friends who have been here, we have uh, represented here. I want to thank you for staying to the end, Colonel Howell, the Director for the National Intelligence Security Agency, um, and our military colleagues who stayed through, uh, Dr. Murray, and all the other members of the university community. Thank you so much, and thank you all online for being wonderful and gracious. We do have 
some, uh, some, some refreshments at the back. So please do take something before you leave um, and mingle, as we say in Guyana, mingle. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you, Captain. You did very well. There's a request for the panel to um, huddle somewhere.